the Silver King. Perhaps the most exciting challenge for the fly fisherman. Billy Pate, four-time world record holder for tarpon cut on the fly, will show you the strategies and techniques that have made him so successful. Whether you're new to the sport of fly rotting for tarpon or you're already addicted, Billy will help you improve your ability to catch more tarpon. Welcome to the Florida Keys. During the next hour, I'll show you how I catch tarpon. And I think you'll see why tarpon hold the reputation as the ultimate in fly fishing excitement. You'll learn the basics of tarpon behavior and where to look for them. Going after tarpon involves unique fly fishing tackle. So I'll show you what you need and how to use it to make fast and accurate presentations to moving fish under challenging conditions. You'll also learn effective techniques for setting the hook and what to do when a fish jumps. I'll show you ways to fight these big fish so you can land them fast and then to release them in good shape. Much of your success will depend on your guide and you'll see just how important a good guide is. Then I'll put it all together for you in some fast action on the tarpon flats with my good friend and guide, Nat Raglan. As with any sport, it's important to know your quarry as well as possible. Very little scientific research has been done on tarpon and a lot more is needed. But here's what we do know about the Silver King. It might be hard to believe that this baby tarpon could grow to a tremendous size. Billy's 1982 world record tarpon was a 188 pound giant caught on 16 pound test tippet. The all tackle record is even bigger, 283 pounds. And there are probably some 300 pound silver giants out there somewhere. Tarpon have a streamlined profile. They're much thicker from top to bottom than they are from side to side. This shape is typical of fish which swim in short high speed bursts to capture their prey. Tarpon swim at speeds that can vary from around two miles to five miles per hour. Unless they're spooked and then they can move much faster. For a big fish in such shallow water, tarpon can be very hard to see because they have a natural camouflage. Their backs are the same color as the dark patches on the bottom, and their silver sides reflect the colors around them like a mirror. Unless they roll or turn sideways, they're difficult to see. That's why you'll enjoy fishing the Keys where their dark backs stand out against the light sand bottom. When tarpon move into an area with a dark bottom, they'll often slow down or hold up over the dark area. It's as if they know the color of the bottom camouflages them from overhead. In the Keys, Tarpon prefer a water depth of three to six feet for traveling and usually swim one to four feet beneath the surface. Like most fish, tarpon have an air sac. But where other fish use their air sacs for stability and buoyancy, tarpon actually use theirs in respiration. When tarpon roll on the surface, they take in air to supplement the oxygen supplied by their gills. This enables them to inhabit water with very low oxygen levels. One of the reasons why they have so much staying power during a fight is that they can get additional oxygen by rolling for air on the surface. When you hook your first tarpon, you'll find out how important that is. Tarpon have no teeth. Instead, they have a very hard bony ridge. This can make setting the hook difficult unless you hook them in the softer corners of the mouth. You can see that tarpon are big and believe me, they're powerful. They have sensational fighting ability and incredible strength. But that's not what really makes them the ultimate fly rod target. They're the ultimate because they love to eat flies, many times when they won't even take a natural bait. They are an ideal fly rod target. If you make the right presentation, about half the time they'll take it. And when they do take, 
You're in for some heart-stopping visual strikes, spectacular leaps, long, powerful runs, a challenging, strenuous battle. To go after Tarquin, you've got to be in your top angling form. The Atlantic species of tarpon have been found from Maine to southern Brazil. There are some concentrations found along the coast of Texas and Louisiana and Georgia and the Carolinas. But for the fly fishermen, the most accessible concentrations in the United States are in Florida, off both coasts and in the Florida Keys. The best time for fishing in Florida is during the annual tarpon migration from March through July. Large schools begin to concentrate in these areas when the water temperature reaches the mid-70s, with 78 to 82 degrees being ideal for tarpon activity. When the water temperature drops below the mid-70s, they move to deeper offshore areas. A tarpon's natural foods include shrimp, crabs, and small bait fish. But they seem to feed opportunistically on just about anything that crosses in front of them. A slick surface makes tarpon spooky and inhibits their surface feeding activity. When the water's choppy, it gives them a feeling of security and they feed more actively near the surface. Although they primarily feed at night, they'll also feed actively in daylight. And that's exciting for you because they usually feed near the surface. Unlike many saltwater fish, tarpon won't hesitate to move upwards to strike. They will chase down an escaping bait fish but they won't turn far off their path to take it, and they favor prey they don't have to outrun. Although they're mainly opportunist, tarpon can be stimulated by curiosity, and they become very competitive when they're feeding. So, why is all of this important to you? Well, it tells you first that they're primarily nocturnal feeders. So a good time to go after them would be early in the morning or late in the afternoon. You'll also find it's better to hunt for tarpon when the wind is up a little, say five to 10 miles an hour. A light chop makes tarpon less spooky and more willing to take your fly. And the small waves on the water become windows that allow you to see through the surface glare. Next. It tells you that you need fast, accurate cast to intercept these fish. Tarpon will move up to feed, but they won't turn far off their path laterally. You'll also need a smooth, steady retrieve to entice a tarpon. They are attracted to a retreating motion, and they will, in a short burst, capture what they think is food. Now you know a lot about what I know about tarpon behavior. And why I get so excited about the possibility of hooking one of these great fish. But understanding your quarry is only the beginning of the journey toward the mastery of tarpon on the fly. Contrary to what most tackle shops might tell you, the most important element in successful tarpon fishing is a good guide. Why is a guide so important? Well, let's say you've decided to fish the Keys. Now, how do you locate where the tarpon are going to be today? It's a big ocean out there, and tarpon are only in a small fraction of 1% of the water. You'll seldom find them in the beginning by yourself. That's why you need an experienced guide. The guides know the water. They understand the influences of water temperature and depth, wind and tide. They're fishing just about every day, and they know where the tarpon are most likely to be at any given time. The guide also provides the boat and the tackle if you need it. But most important of all, he takes you to the fish. He pulls and uses the electric motors to move the boat quietly through the water while hunting for tarpon. He's the primary fish spotter. He's up on an elevated platform, and he has better tarpon vision. He'll spot tarpon when all you might see is just water. To help you see where the fish are coming from, the guide will use the boat like a clock face to point out directions. The bow is 12 o'clock or straight ahead. 3 o'clock is 90 degrees to the right. 
9 o'clock is 90 degrees to the left, and so on. Once the fish are spotted, the guide positions the boat for the best casting angle and coaches your presentation. When the fish is hooked, the guide will maintain the best distance and angle to help you fight the fish most effectively. When you've tired the fish, he'll land it and release it for you. This is a team effort, so listen to your guide. On most tarpon skiffs, the angler stands on a flat deck near the bow. Billy added a casting platform to his boat. From this higher position, he can see fish sooner and make longer, more accurate casts. If you're new to tarpon fishing, I'd suggest you let the guide provide the tackle. Later on, when you've had more experience, you can bring your own outfit and maybe even tie your own flies. Now let's take a look at the equipment that I use. One of the key principles that directs my selection of tackle is the size, power, and stamina of these great fish. The tackle we need for tarpon fishing is larger and more powerful than other fly rod tackle. Rods like these made of graphite are excellent because they're powerful and yet lightweight. Their smaller diameter is less wind resistant and it makes them faster to cast than fiberglass rods. Remember, you're casting to a moving target. These heavy rods require 12 and 13 weight lines. It's always a good idea to have at least one backup rod in case of a problem. The reel is the most important fighting element because once the fish is taking line from the reel, it's the drag of the reel that beats the fish, not the rod. You need a reel with a smooth drag that has a low startup inertia, so a sudden burst of speed won't break you off. Tarpon can run a long way, so you need a reel large enough to hold a fly line and a minimum of 200 yards of 30 pound test Dacron backing. A reel with an exposed rim will allow you to apply extra drag that you can remove instantly if the fish jumps. Be sure to choose a reliable reel that will operate consistently under a lot of stress. It's a wise investment. Wind and water conditions are constantly changing, so the fish may feed at different levels. I carry four rigs with different densities of number 12 weight forward fly line. That way I can change quickly to meet the needs of the situation and get the fly to the fish. Tarpon usually take near the surface, so I make sure I've got one reel loaded with an Ultra 2 tarpon taper floating line. One with a wet cell intermediate and another with an intermediate wet tip. I also use a monocore because it sinks faster than my intermediate. We call it a slime line because when it's wet, it's very slippery and it shoots really well. It has a clear finish too, great for spooky tarpon. The lines I'm using are bright orange. They were especially made for this videotape to help you see clearly the techniques I'll be demonstrating. The finishes are dull to reduce flash in the air. More fish are spooked by the flash of a line in the air than by a line or fly hitting the water. In contrast to freshwater leaders, tarpon leaders are complex and require a lot of practice to tie. I recommend following the International Game Fish Association's regulations on leaders. I use 16 pound test class tippets. You can use heavier tippets if you wish, but I don't recommend it. With a tippet as light as 16 pounds, landing a tarpon might seem impossible. However, the IGFA allows you to add a stronger 100 pound test shot tippet 12 inches long to help withstand the wear against the tarpon's rough mouth. Making up one of these leader sections requires a series of special knots that can be tied to give 100% strength. Because the knots are complex and the hard mono shock tippet is difficult to work with, I tie up extra leaders beforehand. The details of tying these knots are covered in other tapes in the 3M saltwater fishing series.
I start with a shot tippet and snell the fly to it. That improves my hooking angle and keeps the fly from twisting sideways and appearing unnatural to the fish when I retrieve. At each end of the class tippet, I use a bimini twist, also known as a 20 times around knot. The bimini twist doubles the tippet at both ends without weakening it. The doubled line gives you 100% knot strength where you need it most. IGFA rules require 15 inches between the knots. Now, I tie one end of the double leader to the shock tippet with a double nail knot. Then I jam them together. The heavy shock tippet must be no more than 12 inches long, including the knots. I store the flies and leaders in a special box which holds the shock tippets under tension. This prevents any bends forming in the 100-pound test that could cause the fly to twist in the water. When I'm ready to tie on a new fly, I use a blood knot to attach the other end of the double clash tippet to the 40-pound test butt section of my leader, which is already tied to my fly line. You need a fly that will attract the tarpon's attention and make it want to eat. The key factors in fly selection are color, size, and action in the water. Tarpon strike out of hunger, or perhaps reflex action, or maybe aggression. During calm periods, when the tarpon can see better overhead, a bright fly in the air can spook them. So I recommend a fly with subdued colors for slick conditions. I've also noticed that they are more aggressive and eat better when the wind comes up after a calm period. Then the broken surface allows you to use a bright fly with less chance of spooking the fish. You can see that the hooks are big, but probably not as big as you might think, especially when you compare them to a typical bass fly. I use 2-0 to 4-0 hooks, with 3-0 as a good all-round choice. and I keep them razor sharp and barbless. Tarpon mouths are tough. Barbless hooks will penetrate easier than hooks with a barb. Also, if you hook yourself or the guide, you'll be glad there's no barb. Saltwater is a new frontier for fly fishermen. So there haven't been as many patterns developed for tarpon as there have been for trout or steelhead. Here are some of them. This is a purple pimpernel. This is an orange quindilla, and this is a cockroach. I use this brown and gray pattern for a good deal of my fishing. The hackles are tied close to the bin to keep the feathers from fouling around the hook. Tarpon won't go for a foul fly. So if you retrieve your fly and find the feathers tangled, make sure to straighten it out before you recast. You or your guide should have several different patterns and sizes of flies tied up on leaders ready to use. There are no absolutes here, so be prepared to experiment to find out what fly the tarpon will take today. Well, aside from deck shoes, your hat, polarized sunglasses, and sunblock, I've pretty well shown you what you need in the way of tarpon equipment. Now, I'll show you how to find tarpon. Here in the Keys, there are routes that tarpon travel. Your guide knows these routes. He also knows the ideal depths during the changing tides, how the bottom contours influence the direction the tarpon take, and where the best places are to wait or stake out. Your guide will tell you the direction they're probably coming from, sometimes even the exact route. This knowledge is what you pay for in a good guide. But there are times when tarpon don't follow the predicted routes. Then your guide will pole the flats, hunting for them in areas where he knows tarpon have been seen. You must always be alert and ready for approaching fish. You can often see the fish for a long distance, especially over a bright sandy bottom. That's what's so great about fishing on the ocean side of the Keys. The sooner you see the fish, the better your opportunity to catch one. 
you'll have time to plan your cast and the chance for a second cast if the first one isn't productive. It's your guide's primary responsibility to find tarpon for you, but it's to your advantage to help him, so you need to know what to look for. Tarpon move through the water in several configurations. A school is a large group of tarpon. A smaller, tightly packed grouping is often called a pod. Then there are occasional loners or singles. Or maybe you'll see a string of tarpon moving past in single file. The configuration that you'll look forward most to seeing is what is called a daisy chain. A daisy chain is a ring of tarpon swimming head to tail in a circle. Very little is known about their spawning behavior, but I believe tarpon form daisy chains just before spawning. They seem to be less spooky in a daisy chain, and they can remain in one for several minutes, giving you plenty of time for multiple casts. Those were some great shots of tarpon from a perfect vantage point, but when you're fishing, a view probably won't be as good. So look for any unnatural disturbance of the water. For instance, this is nervous water, water that is shakier or choppier than the water around it. Nervous water is caused by the fish moving just under the surface or into the wind. Be on the lookout for any gray, green, or brown mass that moves or looks different from the water around it. And try to spot the tip of a tail or a fin. That could be all you'll see when the fish is laying up, that is, resting near the surface. Watch for flashes off the silver sides of a tarpon. And remember, tarpon roll to fill their ass sacks. So look for the splash or reflection off the side of a rolling tarpon. Also be alert for a bust. That's a big splash on the surface. You might hear one before you see it. How tarpon are moving gives you a good indication of whether or not they're going to eat. These nervous fish are unhappy. See how they're quickly moving one direction and then another? They're spooky. That means you have to be careful with your presentation and you'll probably only get one cast. I want fish that are laid up or moving lazily near the surface or daisy chaining. Those are happy fish. They're the ones most likely to take your fly. And because they're moving lazily near the surface, you'll have a better chance of getting more shots at them. In the world of saltwater fly fishing, everything happens faster. Unlike freshwater fish, tarpon are seldom stationary. There's no time to practice your cast. You have to see the fish sooner, cast quickly, and you often only get a one or two shot opportunity. Many fishermen lack the discipline to be in a state of constant readiness. Those who have that discipline catch more tarpon. While I'm waiting for tarpon, I hold my rod in line in the ready position. Here's how you do it. Using 16 pound test tippet, I preset my drags at three to four pounds. That's strong enough to set the hook, but it's light enough to protect the tippet from most of the tarpon's sudden jumps and powerful runs. Then cast out a comfortable distance and strip in the line and coil it away from your feet. Having more line on the deck that you can comfortably cast increases your chances of tangling the line and breaking off. With this special tarpon taper, I've used a waterproof pin to mark an indicator on the line about 30 feet from the tip to tell me how far to strip in before I cast. For the ready position, strip in the line until the indicator is in the fingers of your rod hand. This leaves about 20 feet of line out past the tip. Now, hold the fly between the thumb and forefinger. Then place the knot that ties the fly line to the leader between your middle finger and ring finger. That makes a loop of the leader section. All this gets you into action quicker. 
All right, from this ready position, I make a quick forward cast. I shoot a little line on the back cast and go for the target. It happens fast, so watch it again in slow motion. Drop the fly, roll cast, back cast, shoot 10 feet, and I've got 30 feet of line in the air. Then I can shoot to whatever I need to reach the fish. Casting to tarpon on the flats is probably different than what you're used to on a lake or a stream. Here, it's important to get the fly to the fish as far away as you can cast accurately. A long cast will give you time to interest an eater before the fish gets too close to the boat and shies off. It will also create the opportunity for additional casts before the fish moves on. Try to eliminate unnecessary false casting. It wastes time if the fish are in casting range, and the line in the air can spook the fish. Much has been written about the need for 80 and 100 foot casts for tarpon, but most casts are actually 70 feet or less. But casting a large tarpon fly 70 feet, even into a light wind, means you must be able to double haul to get it that far. Take a look at Doug Swisher's video on advanced fly casting for a demonstration of double hauling. He also covers changing direction in wind casts. Both will be helpful for tarpon fishing. There's one rolled about 10 o'clock, Billy. A little short, close roll. Going left to right. Okay, I got it. There he comes, there he comes, there he comes. He, he's got it. Hot dog. <laughs> got her clear, Billy? Yep, clear. Look out, there goes your hat. Move my hat. Jump, come on boy, jump. Let's see your body. There you are. Well, he gobbled it up, didn't he? He really wanted it. Well, he's been real nice so far. Coming right to us. Coming back our way. Here he comes. Whew. There he went. Gave me my fly back. Well, we don't have to put another fly on, just sharpen the hook. <laughs> oh well, we'll get another one. Well, it's exciting even when you lose them, but I hate to lose them. Nat and I are gonna pick up and run to another location, and then I'll show you what you need to see before you cast. Now, here you are, ready to get hooked up. Your guide spots the fish, you turn and wait. You'd better not cast until you know what you're casting to. When the tarpon are in sight, don't panic and cast at anything that moves. Getting a cast off quickly is only part of the equation for hooking up. Where your fly lands is even more important. First, you have to see the fish well enough to know the direction that they're moving in so that you can determine the intercept point. That's the point to which you cast your fly so that it lands in the path of the tarpon. Remember, they usually won't move but a couple of feet off their path to feed. Next, try to determine the exact edge of the school. It's important to know where all the fish are because you don't want to line any fish. Much of the school can be swimming below and outside of the fish that you see on the surface. One of those unnoticed fish might see your line in the air and spook the rest of the school. Discipline is important. Moving too quickly before you know where to cast can blow your chances. Your guide can help. He's in a better position to see fish. Even though you're excited, don't stop listening to your guide. Okay. You've spotted the tarpon, you know the direction they're moving in, and you've determined the edge of the school. Now, where do you place your fly? There are few opportunities, so you need to make the most of each one. The skilled angler gets in more high probability casts for every opportunity than the novice does. It's more difficult 
than in fresh water because in salt water there are so many variables and so little time to react. Here are the guiding principles. Tarpon don't want to turn more than 90 degrees or more than a couple of feet off that course to take a fly. That's a strike zone. The less a tarpon has to move off its path, the higher your probability for a strike. That's why I stress practicing for accuracy. Another thing to keep in mind is that a tarpon will spook if your fly moves towards him because his natural food always moves away from him. Also, to get your fly to the intercept point, you must cast to where the tarpon will be and not where you see them. You've got to lead the fish. Your goal is to cast your fly where it has the highest probability for success. The farther you can cast accurately, the better your angle will be. And your best angle is head on to the fish. Your guide will do what he can to position your boat for that head on shot. Head on is best because the strike zone is larger. It's a full 180 degrees and about four feet across and the tarpon is moving directly towards you. So it won't have to move off its path to take the fly. It's easy for the opportunistic tarpon to follow your fly, giving it a lot more time to take. If you cast soon enough, just before the tarpon get into your casting range, it's almost impossible for you to overshoot and spook the fish. If you undercast, you can let the fly sink while the fish approaches then pull it up slowly to meet him, or you have time to recast. Your probability for a hookup decreases geometrically as you get farther away from a head-on shot. See how the angle within the strike zone decreases? Because the fish is not moving in the same direction as your fly, your accuracy becomes more critical. Plus, the fly is in the strike zone for a much shorter time. Now the tarpon must move off its path to take. If you overcast, you won't get a take and you may spook him if you retrieve your fly. So let the fish swim by and try for another cast. You've got nothing to lose. If you undercast, strip in as fast as you can for a recast. As the tarpon moves past your position, the need for a very accurate cast increases and your probability for a hookup decreases. The fish is going somewhere, and he'd rather gulp the flies he's moving along than turn 90 degrees off his path. There's no doubt about it. The same basic principles hold when you work a school. But the bigger and more tightly packed the school, the higher the probability for your success. Here's why. First, with a head-on angle to a school, your strike zone increases to match the width of the school and competition comes into play. The tighter the fish are packed, the greater the competition between them. With the school coming towards you, there's loads of time for any one of them to see your fly and gulp it on the run. If you don't get a hook up head on, you still have the opportunity for a second cast as the fish moves past your position. But your probability will be lower because the strike zone is getting smaller. One of the advantages of casting to a school is that if you overcast the fish you're aiming for or undercast him, another fish might swim into striking distance of your fly. So watch where your fly lands and listen to your guide. He can see your fly and the fish better than you can. Finally, as the fish moves away, your chances for a take drop dramatically. It's always worth the effort as long as you're in casting range. But the angle is extremely narrow, so your cast must be very accurate. Now you're trying for the last couple of fish in the school, and they still won't move far off their path for a fly. The probabilities for a hookup are actually highest when you find tarpon in a daisy chain. But you will have to adapt your presentation to suit that unique configuration. I'll show you those techniques in my next tape, The Challenge of Giant Tarpon. Just as important as knowing where to cast is knowing when to cast. 
your timing. When do you make your move to get your fly to the intercept point? The fish and the boat will be moving at different speeds. Then there's the direction of the wind and the tide to consider. It takes experience and practice. You must cast to where the tarpon will be and not to where you see them. Be sure to lead the fish by 10 to 15 feet. That's why I emphasize practicing your timing. You must know how long it takes you to cast a comfortable maximum distance. Develop your casting technique and rhythm so that it's the same every time, because everything else varies. Timing it perfectly will come with experience. It took me years. For now, rely on your guide. He'll tell you when to cast and how far to lead them. See, I told you your guide's important. That was a nice fish. Tarpon always give you a good fight. My cast got to fly right into his strike zone, but it was a retrieve that got him to eat. There are several key principles that govern how I retrieve. We know that tarpon won't move far off their path to take a fly and they don't normally come up more than a few feet. So, try to let your fly sink at least a foot before beginning the retrieve. Your guide can help you determine when to start your retrieve. Start it slowly. A sudden movement of the fly could spook the fish. Keep your rod tip low and pointed at the fish. The low rod angle allows you to make a longer striking motion than you could make with the rod held high. It also keeps you in good position to make a second cast if necessary. Strip in the line in about 15 inch strips and let it fall in loops on the deck away from your feet. I recommend that you wear deck shoes without laces to avoid tangling the line. And look often to make sure you're not standing on the line either. Remember tarpon are very strong and fast. So don't wrap the line around your hand or you might get hurt. And don't call it in the palm of your hand either, because you're likely to get a tangle when the fish takes off. The speed of the tarpon will help determine how fast you retrieve the fly. A fast moving fish will respond to a fast retrieve, and a slow moving fish will take a slower retrieve. You need experience to know what speed of retrieve to use, so rely on your guide to tell you. Once a tarpon is following the fly, never slow it up. If a fish begins moving towards your fly and hesitates, speed up the retreat. It could excite him to strike. They'll often charge the fly if they think it's going to get away. But they may shy off if it slows down. If a tarpon is following, it can take it any time. So I retrieve right up to the boat. Your guide can see the fish and your fly better than you can. He'll tell you how far to cast, how fast to retrieve, when to vary it, and when to pick up and try again. I've covered a lot of information. You'll have to review it several times to get it all. But that's what this videotape was designed for. Next. I'll show you how to hook up and fight a Silver King.
have any chance of landing a tarpon, you must set the hook securely. You must be disciplined and wait till you feel the fish before you set the hook. This can be seconds after the take because the fish is often swimming towards you. After you feel the fish, hold the line tight and hit him hard by pulling down with your line hand and striking back and sideways with the rod. That way you can exert much more force than you can when striking with an upwards pull. The fish will react by jumping or taking off. Now, ignore the fish and concentrate on clearing the line to the reel. Hold the rod butt tightly against your stomach or forearm to keep the line from wrapping around it and hold the line loosely out away from your body to avoid tangling it. When the line is on the reel, without holding the line, hit him again to drive the hook home and be ready for a jump. Whenever a tarpon jumps, you must bow quickly from the waist and extend your rod arm towards the fish to keep him from breaking off. If you don't, it'll really be a short fight. Most jumps occur early in the fight. Fish tire themselves and sometimes get hurt when they jump. Usually, the more jumps, the shorter the fight. When tarpon jump, they pick up more velocity as they leave the denser medium of the water and enter the less dense air. They can also violently shake their heads. Both actions put more pressure on your leader. Just dipping the rod like you would for a big trout won't be enough. You must bow quickly and give line to release that pressure and save the tippet. Tarpon often telegraph a jump by shaking their heads before taking off. If you feel the line accelerating or see it rising in the water, he's probably going to jump. Be alert and ready to bow to the fish. Well, I've shown you how to hook a tarpon, but I've yet to see any two tarpon that bite exactly alike. So Nat and I are gonna go out and jump some fish and show you how to fight them to win. Right there, about seven o'clock, Billy. Yeah, right there, aren't they? A nice fish. Eat it. There he is. There he is. Come on, boy. He got it. Way to go, fish. Took off like a scalded dog. Whoa. Coming back. Well, we lost him. I don't know which. I think he's coming back. Yep. There he is. He's still there. I won't say it. He has one. Woo! Gone again. Cutting back to the right a little. When that gets moves me up a little bit, I'm taking it in. I'm trying to pace myself right now because. I don't want to fight him until I get him on the fly line, then I'll bear down on him. Right now, I'm taking it easy on him. You don't know how much pressure you're putting on a tibbet. You're gonna have a big belly in your line, and if you've got a lot of line out, you know what kind of pressure you got on your reel, but you don't know how much that belly is putting on it between you and the fish. Here comes the fly line. Okay, let's bear down on him. Okay, we're up close on him now. We got him pretty tired. I'm gonna give him a down and dirty here, see if I can back him. Not quite ready to back, he said. I keep changing the angle on him. I'll pull him up. I'll pull him down. Pull him mostly to the right now, because he's going left. He bolted there when he saw me. Bolted back to the right again. Give him a down and dirty. Try to back him. He's a lively fish. Well, you look like about 80. Yeah, about 80. Well, some of the things that's working in close are that you don't exert any extra pressure when you've got them in close than you do when they wear out. You don't want to get over anxious because more fish are lost right here than anywhere in the game, except when you first jump them. So you try to keep the same steady pressure. 
Ah, he's nice. That's the way. Pull that bow right around to him. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about running the butt section leader up in the rod tip either. Yeah, got the butt, butt section way up in there. Got a pretty good back on him. See the fly right on the roof of his mouth up there on the yep. left like, hand side. That's where I like to hook him, right at the top. Top of the mouth, you can control him better when you hook him there. Pretty soon you're going to be able to get him up here so I can put this uh, lip gaff in him. It can last 10 minutes, it can last a half hour. Some fish look awful easy, deceptively easy, and then when you try to move in on them with a the lip gaff, they're tough. Like that one. Yeah. Maybe one of those boys. He just woke up when I gave him the down and dirty, but I'm gonna give it to him again. He woke up again. Said he didn't like that down and dirty. He didn't breathe too well when that happened. I think he's about ready to take that. See the dirty Nelly right in the top of the lip. I like, I like to hook them there. You can control them better. Doing a fine job, Billy. I sure I'm getting tired sitting here watching you do this. <laughs> Look at that How head you shape. like that, sport fan? Yeah. Now, you want to run under our boat? OK. Well, if he goes under the boat, I put the rod down under that so he doesn't break the rod of the line. Real deep, real quick. I want to break this line of the rod. Okay, right in the top of the lip, Billy. Did you ease up yeah. on the drag? I yeah, eased up on the drag in case he jumps off the gaff and runs under the boat, he won't break my line. See, he's got a real rough mouth. You see, there are no teeth there, but everything in his mouth is bone. Very little place you can, you can hook a fish in that mouth. <sighs> Mostly gristle, some hard gristle and then bone. Yeah, he's a pretty nice fish, about 85 pounds. There he is. And he's off and running. <laughs> Way to release him. Let him live to fight another day. Another day. Go get another one. Thank you, Captain. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Better come down to the level. Coming on. Coming. Come on, eat oh, it. Oh, heard of them in this spot. Heard. You're right on. One's coming. Got it. Look at on the run. He's mad. He's a hot fish. Really a hot fish. I couldn't see him real good because we didn't have any sun. Finally, I made a cast anyhow where I thought they would be from the push that I saw. Ended up I was in the right spot. I saw the fish when he took it. He just took it right on the run. It must have been right in his line of fire. I'm not really fighting him now. Nat's moving the boat up quickly as we can go with the electric motors. Right now, I'm just taking line. So while I'm taking line, I want to make sure I've got it level across my reel, because if I build it up on one side and then the fist surges, that line can slough off and sometimes create a knot. So while you're taking your back and back in, you're not really fighting him. You're just taking line in. Be real careful about winding it level on your spool. When you're making your pumps, make sure that you're not losing any line off of your reel. Kind of hold it with your forefinger when you make your pump, then let it down straight and reel all the way down straight. Then pump up again. But make sure you're not losing any line off your reel and make sure you're putting it straight onto your reel. Okay, now we're gonna, we're gonna pull him to the left to keep him off balance. 
Then we're going to pull him some to the right to try to keep him off balance. Always continually vary your pull, sometimes to the left, sometimes to the right. When we get close on him, we'll give him the down and dirty, which is like this, and that's the most effective of all for beating him. If you're on a rocking deck and you got a lot of wind, be sure to keep your feet spread apart with a good wide stance. That gives you stability for a rocking boat. All right, down and dirty, fish. Back you up, see? Back him up on his side, out of the water. There he goes again. He's still got a lot of life in him. You know, he looks like he's beat, but he's not. We'll screw down the drag just a little bit now and put about an extra pound of drag on it. That'll slow him up a lot. Now I can give him a down and dirty, which really hurts him. You don't want to get too anxious. You want to keep playing him just like you've been playing him. Pace yourself. You're tired and you don't want to make any mistakes, so you do just what you've been doing. Don't get over anxious because that's where most of the fish are lost right when you get ready to try to gaff him. I'll give him a down and dirty and back him up. He doesn't like that down and dirty, does he? <laughs> he sure don't. Loosen the drag, Casey bolts, comes off the gaff. Okay, okay. Billy. Hard mouth. Yeah, man. Nice job. Okay, down he goes. Let's see if he <coughs> needs a little help in here. Think we need to run the electrics? No, I don't think so, Billy. He's still a little warm. There he goes. He's okay. Still got some fire left in him. He wanted to be a movie star. Boy, what a jumper. It's taken us over three years to complete my tarpon series. During that period, there have been important changes in tarpon equipment, including clothing like tarpon wear. It was designed for comfort in hot weather, and it gives you the freedom of motion that you need to make those long casts. I sure wish we'd had it during the shoot. Fly lines keep getting better and better, too. I really like the Ultra 2 tarpon type of fly line because it shoots well with a minimum of tangles. The reels are always being improved too. This is the latest version of my anti-reverse reel, and this is a new System 3 direct drive reel. Both have super smooth drags. Well, we've covered a lot in this tape. Everything you need to know to be successful at fly riding for tarpon. You learned about their natural food and how their feeding behavior makes them a perfect fly rod quarry. I showed you the different types of equipment that I use. Throughout the tape, you saw how much help a good guide can be. I showed you how to locate tarpon and what to look for before you make your cast. Then, I took you through the casting and retrieving techniques that attract tarpon to the fly. Finally, you saw how to hook and fight a tarpon to win. I've jumped over 4,000 tarpon in the 24 years I've been hunting these great fish, and they've taught me a lot. It's taken me a lifetime to develop the techniques I've shown you in this tape, and I hope they serve you as well as they have served me. Fly fishing for tarpon is always a thrill, so if you get a charge out of hooking up a 100-pound fish, join me in my next video when I hunt for that elusive 200-pound giant tarpon. I'll build on the principles and techniques presented in this tape to show you how to fight and land a tarpon on a fly rod that could be larger than you are. It's the most exciting fly fishing I know.
it's excitement you're after. Come fishing with the experts from 3M Scientific Anglers and learn ways to catch more and bigger trout on the fly. You'll learn where to find trout in a stream and ways to present the right fly with the perfect cast so you can catch the most elusive trout during hatch and non-hatch situations. Plus, they're steelheading for 20-pound rainbows or going for the ultimate saltwater challenge. Let 3M Scientific Anglers bring home the excitement while you learn a lifetime of mastery techniques that will help you become the best fly fisherman you can be. There's no other sport like fly fishing. It can truly give you a lifetime of discovery and enjoyment. Whether you fish your own favorite stream or travel the world with your fly rod, there's no end to what you'll learn. To help speed you along your path of discovery, Scientific Anglers from 3M has recruited some of the world's best fly fishermen to produce a complete learning system of videotape programs. Unlike simple how-to videos, the Scientific Angler's Mastery Series shows you more than just tips. It gives you an easy-to-learn formula for success to truly help you become a master angler. There are programs designed to give you a strong foundation of knowledge and skill. At the next level, the Mastery System helps you integrate the skills and knowledge into sophisticated fly fishing strategies. And for the expert, there are challenge level programs that offer original and innovative techniques to help you master the most difficult fly fishing situation. Think of it as a learning path towards fly fishing mastery. The tape you just viewed is part of that path. In Doug Swisher's Trout Series, Scientific Anglers presents a four-part program that features a natural learning progression. First, there's basic fly casting where you learn loop control and the principles of throwing a perfect straight line cast. Then you move on to advanced fly casting, building your skills with more complex casting techniques, including curve and reach casts. Now you're ready for action as Strategies for Selective Trout shows you how to fish a hatch from bottom to top. And you'll almost feel the strike as Doug demonstrates ways to take difficult trout in non-hatch conditions. Finally, in advanced strategies for selective trout, Doug teaches you his most sophisticated methods, including ways to successfully fish the midge, how to unlock the mysteries of masking hatches and special streamer tactics to catch big trout. You'll be part of the action as you look through the eyes of the expert and learn the real whys behind the mastery of fly fishing for trout. While you're improving your streamside skills, you may also want to learn to tie your own flies. Gary Borger shows you a step-by-step -step approach to the basics of fly tying. And Doug Swisher demonstrates how to tie flies to match the hatch and his deadly attractor patterns. If you're hooked on catching the big ones, you've got to see the four-part series on fly fishing for Pacific Steelhead. Lonnie Waller and Jim Teeny will provide you with a complete arsenal of skills so that you can take these giant rainbows even in the most challenging conditions. But that's not all. Scientific Anglers takes you south to watch world record holder Billy Pate demonstrate his secrets of success for hooking up and landing the ultimate fly fishing game. And if you love fishing, hunting, and other sports, Think of 3M as your total video resource for outdoor adventure. Explosive action. In-depth information. Incredible scenes. 3M Sportsman's Video Collection brings you the world of bass fishing with America's top anglers like Doug Hannon, Ricky Klein and Al Linder, a comprehensive learning series that'll make you the best bass angler on your lake. You'll be glad you watch these programs when you catch the bass of a lifetime.
gentle beauty of a deep forest glade. The heart-pounding excitement of a trophy buck in rut. Going one-on-one -on -one with North America's most popular big game animal. That's what deer hunting's all about. And nobody brings you more in-depth information and true life action than the 3M Sportsman's Video Collection. The excitement of calling a bird into your gun. The satisfaction of making a clean shot. And the companionship of a well-trained dog. If you like the challenge of upland, game bird, and waterfowl hunting, 3M Sportsman's video collection gives you the thrill of being there and the knowledge you need to master the sport. If you're serious about having fun on the slopes, then the video series Skiing with Style is just for you. 3M got together with Skiing Magazine and the Professional Ski Instructors of America to bring you a unique, proven training method that will help you learn more advanced techniques faster than you ever thought possible. You'll feel like you're skiing right along with the pros as you build your confidence and learn new skills that can make the entire mountain your playground. Be sure to see the Skiing with Style series from 3M. And you'll be looking good out on the slopes.